Welcome to the DPS Front Lobby. This is a critical part of our operation because whether you're calling in for sales or tech support or anything else, we want you to talk to a real live human. We never want you to be stuck in a voicemail maze because we always want you to feel like we're giving you the absolute best service you've ever had. So now that we've been here in the lobby, let's go ahead and take a look at sales. Welcome to the DPS Sales Department. Doing business the way that we do, it would never work for us to have a standard run-of-the-mill sales team. We need to have technical experts, and there's none better than Ron here, who's a co-founder, been here since day one. So moving on past Ron, we have some other senior salespeople. Rick's actually out visiting a client on the East Coast this week. And of course, we have to have a pipeline of newer talent. So some of our newer salespeople come in and from the very first day, as they're learning about our technology, they're calling people to invite them to factory training, to tell them about new products that have been released, and generally just reminding them that we exist and we provide total service if they have a project that they'd like us to help with. So that's a quick run through sales. Now let's head on over to engineering. So first up in engineering, we have MIS. This is where we build all of our own internal tools because we always want to be in total control of our process. And that means building our own CRM, building tools to control the website, email newsletter, production, metal, everything. We want to build that from scratch. Sergey here heads up engineering. You can see he's got some uh, cool stuff there on his desk. It looks like he's working on some code. And the next up we come to circuit board design. So Matt here designs the traces that will go into our various circuit boards to drive the hardware of our products. Then we also have metal design. Benny's out right now doing a training with the metal guys over in the metal shop. And now we come to programming. This here is Rich. He heads up Teamon programming. That's our Teamon master station. Hey, Then we also have RTU programming. Those are our remote boxes that go out to remote sites. And then I really want to show you guys the tech lab. This is a really fun place because it serves a couple different purposes. First, you can see we have copies of a lot of our different products. That way if somebody calls in reporting a bug, we can run tests and try to get it sorted and replicate that bug here so we can stomp it out. Then we also have some third party equipment the idea is if you want our team on to talk a certain protocol for an older piece of gear that you got, we tell you just send us one of them, we'll play around with it, we'll figure out how that protocol works, and we'll design it and build it into our product. So a lot of this is for compatibility testing. Now down the hall outside of the tech lab, there is one more test station I definitely want to show you, so follow me this way. This is a temperature test chamber. We can crank this thing down to minus 20, minus 30 degrees, all the way up to oven, many hundreds of degrees, because we want to be able to see, can our devices work in an uncontrolled cabinet in the northernmost reaches of Canada, and can it work boiling in a cabinet in Texas, say. So now we've seen this test, but there's one even more impressive test chamber I want to show you, the EMI chamber. So follow me this way. So here we are at the EMI chamber. This is where we test our equipment to make sure that it puts off just a minimum of interference. Because if we can do that, not only will we not disrupt any other equipment that's out in the field with us, but also it suggests that we have a very low interference profile and we won't be absorbing much. It makes us much more reliable. So let's step inside and have a look at the chamber. It's got a really big impressive door here. As we step inside, you'll notice that the sound changes pretty immediately. These cones provide a very clean environment. They're going to absorb anything that strikes them. We're primarily focused on interference, but they have a side effect of absorbing sound, so there are no echoes in here. When it's coming time to test a piece of equipment, we load it onto this rack. 
We then power it with boat batteries so there's no outside power grid interference. And we use two antennae to measure. We have an omnidirectional here, and then this antenna is focused directly on the unit under test. And right through the wall here, we have a console where we can monitor on the oscilloscope to see what's going on as we perform various tests. So that concludes engineering, so now let's go have a look at production. So here we are outside the production floor. Let's head in and I'll show you how it all works. Got to put on my smock. A lot of the stuff in here is sensitive to electricity. We don't want to zap anything with any static. Considering the special nature of this tour, I'm going to give you guys a pass, though you don't have to put on smocks. First thing I want to show you is the SMT room. That's surface mount technology. It's how we put parts onto our circuit boards, so follow me. SMT basically breaks down into three essential parts. First, we have this paste machine. What happens is we load a board underneath here, we lower a stencil down that's been custom designed for that board, we load a bunch of paste onto the machine, and then this squeegee type device smears that paste across. Anywhere there's a hole on that stencil, you end up with paste on the board. Once that's been done, we lift the stencil back up and now we have a board with wet paste on it. We then walk it over to one of our SMT machines. The way these machines work is they pick up a part on the side, it grabs it with vacuum pressure, positions itself within a thousandth of an inch X and Y, then drops it down precisely where it needs to go. And it's following engineering drawings very specifically. It greatly reduces the chance of human error. Once that's complete, we then have one final step to take that board and actually fuse the parts onto it. And that involves this oven back here. We develop a temperature profile so that we're able to melt the solder without frying any of the sensitive parts. We load it here onto the oven. It then runs through. It's a lot like a sandwich oven. And after a few minutes, it emerges out the other side. You can see a finished board looks something like this. So back out on the floor, we get to this rework station. We work on a lot of parts here that, for whatever reason, needed to have some handwork done. It could have been that there was a defect coming off the SMT machines, but also you have some of the older parts that use through-hole technology where the part is actually inserted through the board. The automated machines for through-hole we've turned down. We don't use them much anymore. But to the extent that we have old designs that need through-hole, we work on them here. So past the rework stations, we get to test. This is where we run diagnostic testing so that we know that any product we produce has the best chance of survival once it gets out in the real world. We are running diagnostic firmware that checks to make sure all the hardware is working. We'll power things on, off and on all night to make sure it boots up properly. We don't have any hardware failures. So this is a critical part of production to make sure that we don't ship things out that are not going to work because the farther it gets from us, the more expensive it gets to fix. The final production step is here. This is final assembly. So we are about to head over to the metal shop, but finished metal parts come here, they arrive at this desk, and we use these screwdrivers to attach the board into the metal and then attach the lid onto the metal. So once it gets done here, we have a final product. And those final products, like these, come over here and they're put on this rack to be shipped. So let's take a look at shipping. You can see we have a lot of foam and boxes, just everything you need to be able to ship equipment everywhere. All right, so that's production. Now that you understand how this basically works, let's head over to our final step. We'll go and look at the metal shop because I want you to see how that all works. Welcome to the DPS Metal Shop. It may seem unusual for an electronics company to have a metal shop like this, but really it was quite necessary the way we do business. It doesn't do us any good to have programming done, have a circuit board done. If we don't have the actual metal box to put it in, we can't ship it. Got to put on my safety glasses here. <laughs> Every
Everything in the DPS metal shop starts right here as a four foot by eight foot sheet of aluminum. Once we have this big piece of metal, we need to cut it. And to do that, we use the water jet. The beating heart of the jet is a big electric motor and an intensifier pump. That pumps water pressure up to about 55,000 or 60,000 PSI. And that water then goes through the high pressure line. Over on this side, we have an operator console so you can see what's being cut and what is still going to be cut. And the real business end of the operation is right here at the nozzles. You can see the high pressure water comes through here. And then the garnet line is a second line that's supplying the cutting teeth. This is really fine garnet dust that gets propelled by the water. They mix together and it comes out of that nozzle faster than the speed of sound, cutting through the metal like it's not even there. There's one more thing I want to show you guys about the jet. We're really big on efficiency at DPS. And one of the problems with the jet is there's excess garnet that ends up in the tank. So what we do is we pump it out into this holding basin here, and then it goes out and gets recycled. And there's a company that comes and gives you some value for your residual garnet, and they recycle it and reuse it. So we're able to extract a little bit of extra value out of what would otherwise be total waste. Now that we've cut our metal, we need to bend it into a box. So let's head on over to the press brake. Our press brakes are capable of generating up to 20 tons of force to bend metal up into a box. You can see here some instructions from engineering. Also, this console accepts a bend program from engineering so that it's pretty straightforward to execute the bends that you need. So you can see here, this piece is in process. It's got a couple of the bends executed. And then what Mark's done is he'll load different tooling on the other press brake so he can finish the job. Ready to go. All right, so here we go. We got part of an Act Guardian. Now that we've bent our metal up into a box, we need to powder coat it. And to do that, we'll go right this way. As you can see here, the basic process is to hang the metal up on the rack and spray it with the powder gun. We then put the finished pieces on this rack and roll the entire thing into the oven here so it can bake for several hours. It's an incredibly durable coating. It's ionically bonded to the metal and it just serves us very well. And now that we have our metal powder coated, we need to put labels on all the ports. So to do that, we need to head over to the screen printing room. Let's head on inside and have a look. So the basic silk screen process is to smear ink across the top of a screen. We have the metal piece underneath. And as we smear it across, anywhere there's a hole in that silk screen, you're gonna get ink to go through onto the part. So after we've done that swipe, we lift the screen up. And you can see all the appropriate ports are labeled as they need to be. And then the last step is to load the part into the oven so the ink can get baked on there. Once we've done this, we have one final step for our metal, and to show you that, follow me this way. This final step is hardware insertion. This is necessary because we have to assemble our boxes together. We have to screw the circuit board into the base and the lid onto the base. And so what happens with this process, you load a part onto the anvil, then you load your metal, and when you activate it, that striker comes down and mashes that metal together with the part, and then you have a nut in place, and you just move on to the next one. So that's how parts move through the DPS metal shop.